I'll speak in English um, to, in some ways, honor the city I'm representing. And I'm going to do three things. The first is broad and general reflection on this term smart cities. I'll then talk a bit more about London, specifically about the case of smart transportation. And then I'll finish off with some general reflections, hopefully also for our discussion. Why are we pairing urban technology or technology more generally with cities? Well, there were already a few comments made which were very clear why this is happening. There's an urban turn happening globally. We'll tend to relate more and more our global societies to urban issues. And that's, of course, also a good reason to link technology to the experience of cities. There's also a lot of solutionism happening that is directly targeting the city sphere. Congestion, air pollution, crime, typical urban issues are at the forefront of what technologists are trying to solve. We are also seeing urban technology moving downtown. Silicon Valley may be history. We may be moving into much more urbane areas of innovation. The downtown areas, the properly urbane rather than suburban areas where innovation can take place. And lastly, any conversation about political issues will have to bring us back to the city as the archetype of a forum of collective decision making. Now, why is it that we're talking about the specific term, the smart city? When I moved to London in 2001, the term was more or less synonymous with the sustainable future-oriented city. And that only changed in 2007-8 as a result of the world financial crisis and some smart thinking within IBM. What is the next product they can sell to no longer the private sector, but to the public sector? That was the moment where the term smarter cities was created and you would have found the term all over global airports. This is the reason why we're talking about this terminology today. It was incredibly attractive. Many cities used it then as a label. In Europe, certainly Barcelona and Amsterdam came on board. Then national governments realized smart cities, very good. The European Union launched big initiatives, the United States, national governments, and most recently India. If you now look what India is actually referring to as a smart city, we're almost back full circle because it's 80% about good urban development more generally and not about technology. That's an interesting journey we should consider. Now, let's get a bit more specifically into what has happened since the term emerged, what was promised, and uh, the real reality. The initial idea was really to talk about an efficiency revolution and much more effective governance. And then probably very much to the frustration of IBM, we didn't have the big integrated ICT infrastructures and physical systems that come with it. Also very much to the frustration of Siemens that was betting on this. Instead, what we have seen a lot is bottom-up, bubbling up of consumer-oriented apps and big data, clearly a massive change. And we're also pretty certain that the big terms which we'll have to get warm with are automation, Internet of Things, digital fabrication, cryptocurrencies, and virtualization. That's going to be here to stay as issues for the future. Now let's move to London. London generally, if you think of its general positioning, actually doesn't use the term smart city as excessively as other cities. The big direction is still a global city, now terribly suffering with Brexit, obviously, and a sustainable city. These are the two terms used in our strategic planning documents. But increasingly, London is realizing that its traditional reliance on the fire sector, that's finance, uh, insurance, real estate, is no longer future-oriented, and that the tech industry needs to play an enormous role in London, and in fact, is doing so increasingly. Let's see whether this is going to survive the current problems uh, the country is facing. London and the UK also have very active smart city policies, trying to attract entrepreneurs for the country as a whole, but also specifically to London. And the new London government in existence since 2000 is embracing the idea of digital innovation. It has a smart city or digital uh, data officer, uh, and in particular, the transport sector has made major progress for which it's often celebrated. But it's also less strong in important areas where Berlin clearly is taking the lead, energy, waste, water, and big integrated solutions. These are areas where London is surely not a leader. So let me stick to the area where progress has been seen. 
smart transport. And let me share one figure up front which gives you a sense of that change is happening in London. Between 1998 and 2013, the share of car travel in the city, a growing city, a city with enormous economic success over that period, fell from 44%, the dominant use of transport, to just 33%. That is something no one predicted and is a direct uh, result, in parts also, uh, to these new digital solutions the city can rely upon. Prior to any talk of smart cities, and this is important to remember, 20 years before the term actually entered the center stage, London built the Dockland Right Rail, which is an autonomous system since 87. Just keep that in mind because we often lose perspective and think it's all so present. Also, the most radical policy London rolled out in terms of uh, um, managing traffic, congestion charging, happened long before smart terminology was introduced. Uh, and only two days ago, on the back of a relatively basic technology of congestion charging, which is recognizing license plates, we have introduced the T-charge, the toxic charge. If you drive into central London today with an old diesel vehicle, it's 10 pounds on top of the 12 pounds congestion charge. So that's enabled by good old technology. What has happened since? Well, I think London is very much in line with what big world cities have done over the last 10 years. Cycle higher, of course. Now a massive revolution with station-free, free-floating uh, bike hire schemes, which the Chinese companies are bringing in. No one knows how to regulate or deal with it at the moment. London opened its data in 2010, the transport data, which led to a revolution in applications and many entrepreneurs building their livelihoods around making transport more efficient for the consumers. We had uh, the real-time tracking of buses, which was a real innovation not only for consumers, but for the governance of bus services, because it allows for much better contracting related to actual performances with the bus companies you're going to commission. The 2012 Olympic Games allowed for the first time a customer-to-customer -customer communication about how to travel and use London's public transport system, avoiding the hotspots of uh, congestion. London is a car-sharing leader and has been for some time, initially with streetcar and more recently with the zip car and drive now. And of course, it's a relatively deregulated private hire vehicle market, and that's the reason why Uber chose to come to London as the second European city after Paris, the 11th a city in the world. Today there are 40,000 Uber drivers with about three and a half million customers and challenged, as you know. A few weeks ago, London decided to not renew that license and to start sitting down and have an actual bargaining conversation with Uber to finally comply with the rules we have set as a society. This is a really important message and all of a sudden Uber is playing ball, finally. But there are many issues which remain. Um, Logistics, we rarely talk about it, is a big challenge. This is the area where traffic is increasing enormously. Uh, this is more about also architects getting on board, doing things differently. We now have buildings in central London, big high-rise buildings that have little sister or brother buildings further out, where all postal services first go to those buildings and then you have shuttle services between the main hub in the city and the periphery. And Berlin is also a leader in logistic services and has experimented in that direction a lot. We have a massive problem between movement in cities and the place function of streets. And no digital innovation will get us around that conflict. We need to have a convict political conversation about what we want really. Air pollution, road accidents, and also finance of a lot of transport still remains an issue and for the foreseeable future. So to finish uh, on a third point, and that's sort of the more general about how can we enhance our thinking about this? There are few things we should talk less about. Apolitical technological fixes, I think we had it. We don't need more of that in terms of conversations. We also need to reduce the amount of time we spend purely talking about solutionism without understanding the broader implications and sometimes even the problem we are trying to solve. And we need to stop talking about end states of a technological revolution as it's often uh, imagined by engineers and technologists. And I'm saying this as an engineer. What we need to talk much more about in transport, first of all, is, for example, traffic speeds. 
the traffic speeds of autonomous vehicles in the future will be possibly the most important decision we need to make about then formulating how it looks like on the ground. Whether you are autonomous at 70 kilometers an hour is an entirely different story to 15 kilometers an hour, what we actually may want to have in our cities. Vehicle design. Do we want to repeat the mistake of the past of first designing vehicles and then adjusting our cities to them or finally agree what kind of city we want and then tell the bloody vehicle designers to get around building cars that work. <laughs> and more generally, we need to talk about much more, and uh, Mrs. Pop said this already, about the transition rather than this end state. And how do we manage this shift from the current equilibrium, many powers and things are sort of sorted out, to a new one? Labor market implications, absolutely central, and new definitions of privacy. Disrupting is ultimately about these transitions and not about end states. How do we prepare for the unexpected? In China, a cycling revolution is happening just now, as I speak. Five million bikes being rolled out in Chinese cities under bike sharing schemes. No one anticipated this, and not a single Chinese city was prepared for that. We need to talk about the politics of algorithms, the issue of technocratic versus political power, and then the speed of change. Again, you said it very beautifully, much better than I could. Do we really want to accelerate? I mean, all these terms, accelerators here and there, for sure there are areas, and climate change is one of them, where we need to accelerate. But many other areas, it might be much better to take our time, understand what is the implication of this new tech, which we are giving our children. And finally, there's the role of the state. The private sector innovation on the one hand, and how to balance uh, this sort of maybe more piecemeal approach with a much more ambitious, possibly Apollo program approach. And I'm not so sure about the decentralized and centralization story, and we can discuss this a bit more. Um, it turns out that a lot of this real technological innovation historically has been state-led and was very centralized. What we as urbanists may need to, work to acknowledge, and I'm aware of the time, is that we have to consider the city as a physical space first, really have an agreement on what we like and enjoy as human beings in terms of our physical experience of the city, use that then as a platform for innovation, and build these technological solutions around it. If it's happening the other way around, I think we risk a dead end. Thank you very much. <laughs>